drop a like and do share leave your comments and do not forget to subscribe for more videos hi everyone welcome back to the course on introduction to material science and engineering offered by edupedia world previous lectures we discussed about the different strengthening mechanisms that are there in order to increase the strength of a material today we will be starting a new chapter and we will be discussing about uh, something which is known as phase diagrams and uh, the preliminary lecture today will be just to introduce you to several concepts upon which we will build further knowledge so the fundamentals before we, we begin we need to understand that uh, there are certain definitions that needs to be understood better before we understand what phase diagram is so one of the things that you will uh, encounter many a times when discussing about phase diagrams and phases is known as component okay component in metallurgy or in material science refers to a pure metal or compound out of which alloys are made okay so it is either a pure metal or a compound now in order to give you idea about each of these terms i will be using a simple example of sugar water solution okay sugar water solution using this we will understand each of the terms which will define here so in a sugar water solution the components are sugar and water these are the two components present in a sugar water solution fine now system what is a system system can be referred to as a series of alloys consisting of same components what do i mean by this what i mean is that you again using the sugar water example you can have 10% sugar in water or you can have 20% or 30 or 25 so there are different combinations of sugar and water amount that can be present right so this is a series of alloys we normally use in metals but uh, here we can say series of mixtures or series of solutions which has the same components you see the components are sugar and water right what we are varying is we are varying the amount of the independent components of the individual components and this series of different uh, solutions represent a system of solutions or a system of alloys in the case of metal systems right so now we understood what component is we understand the uh, what a system is now we need to understand something which is known as solubility limit solubility limit basically refers to the maximum amount of solute atoms that you can dissolve in a solvent to form a solid solution okay so if you think about it if you try to mix sugar in water you take water at room temperature you put uh, uh, you take one cup of water you add one spoon of sugar you uh, stir it it will mix completely you keep on adding sugar you keep on stirring up till one level you can keep on dissolving all the sugar in the water but beyond a certain level the sugar will no longer dissolve in the water right you will see sugar deposited at the bottom of the water which no longer dissolves in the water so what that means is at that moment when the sugar stops dissolving any further you have reached the solubility limit which means no longer the solute that is the sugar can dissolve in the solvent that is the water therefore solubility limit is a hard limit of the amount of solute that can basically dissolve in a solvent to form a solution 
but the solubility limit is also a function of temperature it depends on the temperature of the solution or of the solvent how can we figure this out in the same example of mixing sugar in water suppose uh, you had water at room temperature and after four spoon of sugar the sugar no longer dissolves try this out you increase the temperature you heat the water then what you will observe is that now the water is able to take or dissolve further amount of sugar so basically by increasing the temperature of the water you were able to increase the solubility limit that is now more amount of solute atoms can dissolve in the solvent that is what i mean when i say that solubility limit depends on temperature in the case of solids dissolving in liquid or solids dissolving in solid the relation is linear that is you uh, not linear rather increasing that is with increase in temperature the amount of solute that can dissolve increases in the case of gases it is normally the opposite if you increase the temperature of the solution or of the solvent then less amount of gas will be able to be retained that is the gas will start to evolve out on increasing the temperature but since we will be fundamentally concerned with metals and metallic systems that is solid systems the solubility limit will be increasing in most of the cases with increase in temperature now let us see this diagram this is a diagram in which uh, we have composition that is weight percent of sugar in this axis this is the composition over here we have 100% water okay 100% water and over here we have 100% sugar so any intermediate position here we have 50% water and 50% sugar this axis is the y axis is the temperature axis as you go up you are increasing the temperature what we observe is that over here we have something written as l this l is referred to as the liquid this is basically a water plus sugar solution okay there is no independent individual sugar left over in this region but in this region across this line across this blue line here we have liquid form of water plus sugar as well as solid sugar deposited so we have liquid plus solid okay and let's take any temperature let's say we are at 20 degree celsius what we see from this graph is that at 20 degree celsius we can dissolve approximately a maximum of somewhere close to 70 percent sugar in water if you add more sugar then it will deposit as solid sugar on increasing the temperature let's say we are at 80 degree celsius at 80 degree celsius instead of the previous amount of 70 percent now we can dissolve around 80 percent of sugar in water right so this line basically separates the region this solubility limit basically separates the region in which sugar completely dissolves in water and the region where sugar is left over and is not able to completely dissolve in water and this line basically represents the solubility limit line as we will see in further lectures this type of representation this diagrammatic representation in which we have one axis devoted to composition of the components these are the components right uh, water and sugar one axis is uh, devoted to percentage of different components and the other axis over here is depo uh, devoted to the temperature and over here the whole area is divided into regions having different what we'll call them as phases we'll see that these are phases this type of diagram is known as phase diagram 
we'll see this in much more details okay so here it is what is a phase a phase is basically a homogeneous portion of a system which has uniform physical and chemical properties uniform physical and chemical properties that is the most important criteria for a given phase so here what we saw is in the sugar water solution case here this liquid or this solution basically which had sugar and water completely dissolved had the same physical and chemical property throughout whether we took it over here here anywhere so this was a phase right whereas in this region we had two phases one was water and sugar solution and the other was solid sugar which was deposited because it could not further be dissolved right so we had two phases here we had single phase here whereas for both the cases we had two components water and sugar okay now that we have an idea what a phase is and uh, this is what I already discussed that in the sugar water syrup case uh, if a complete sugar is dissolved then we have single phase if complete sugar is not dissolved then we have two phases one is the sugar water syrup and the other is the solid sugar fine now how do you distinguish phases we already know the basic definition of phase but a phase the phases are basically separated by distinct boundaries right two phases will be separated by distinct boundary and what is the property across the boundary across the boundary you will have either different physical property or different chemical property or both of them different both physical and chemical properties different so two phases need to have at least some physical property different or some chemical property different or both physical and chemical properties different. You cannot have two different phases having identical physical and chemical properties. Okay? And just to give you an example, in the case of water, you can have ice, you can have liquid water, and you can have vapor right but these three are different phases though they are same component they have the same chemical formula these are different phases they will have same chemical property that is all will be H2O but they will have different physical properties physical manifestation right so this will be in solid uh, phase this will be in the liquid phase this will be gaseous so they have different physical manifestations fine now finally in case there is a single phase present in case you have a system where there is single phase present then we call it homogeneous system right in case there are multi phases present since there is more than one phase it is no longer homogeneous what we call it now is either heterogeneous or it is uh, termed as a mixture so depending on the number of phases present whether it is singular or plural it will be termed as homogeneous or heterogeneous okay now let us uh, discuss see the phase diagram for water as I already s said that water has water is a single component right water is single component H2O but it has ice water and steam three phases present now what phase will be present at a particular temperature and particular pressure will be defined by the combination of the temperature and pressure okay here in this phase diagram we have one axis for temperature the other axis for pressure 
there is no access for component percentage because it is single component it is always water 100% water so we do not need a component percentage access we will have a temperature axis a pressure axis and depending on the combination of temperature and pressure we will get whether we will have the solid state the liquid state or the gaseous state let's take an example let's take uh, atmospheric pressure this is atmospheric pressure that is 1 atm and let's say we are at minus 50 degrees celsius let's say okay let's assume this is minus 50 degrees celsius and we are at one atmosphere's pressure we end up in this region right and this region as we can see is the region for ice by our experience we know that at minus 50 degrees celsius we are supposed to have ice and nothing else given that the pressure is atmospheric pressure now suppose that you take this you keep the temperature at minus 50 degrees celsius itself but you start reducing the pressure you reduce the pressure so low that you enter this pink zone suppose you are over here at this pressure then what will happen what is basically happening is that the ice is getting transferred or converted into steam okay why so basically vapor exists when the vapor pressure is able to overcome the atmospheric pressure right and any solid has some vapor pressure associated with it so ice also has some vapor pressure associated with it because there are atoms on the surface which are uh, which may come off and provide some amount of pressure right similarly liquid water has also some vapor pressure associated with it therefore what is happening over here that the atmosphere pressure is coming so low that the vapor pressure of the atoms from the ice is exceeding the atmospheric pressure thereby the solid ice is converting into vapor steam so here you can see the different phenomena actually happening how you can tweak the pressure and temperature combinations to get a different phase altogether okay now let's uh, jump into the water region if you keep one atmospheric pressure but you go to zero degree celsius we know that at zero degree celsius we have water as well as ice present right so if water as well as ice is present at zero degree celsius that is exactly what is happening here zero degree and one atmospheric pressure is falling at the interface of water ice therefore over here we will have both water and ice increase the temperature further you reach 100% water take that temperature to 100 degree celsius now you are at, you are at the equilibrium of water and steam so you will have at 100 degree celsius and one atmospheric pressure both water and steam increase the temperature further and we get complete steam or complete water vapor right so this is how increase of temperature affects the phase changes and that can be deduced from this phase diagram I would like to draw your attention to a few important details here one is what is known as triple point triple point or it's also called invariant point you will encounter invariant point several times when discussing phase diagrams further but for water it is called triple point triple point is the combination of temperature and pressure at which all the three phases coexist so at 0 0.06 atmospheric temperature and 0 0.01 degree celsius temperature we have ice water and steam all of them three coexisting that is seen here because all the three lines meet at this point okay then we have this point that is 218 atmospheric pressure very very high pressure and 374 degrees celsius quite high temperature over here beyond that you will have something which is known as supercritical fluid 
Supercritical fluid is basically something which has properties of both a liquid and vapor phase. We will not go into details of that. You can study up more about supercritical fluid if you want. But we do not need for our understanding any further. The only take home is supercritical fluid has properties of both liquid and so of vapor state coexisting. And that temperature and pressure combination is known as critical point beyond which we have supercritical fluid. Okay, so this gives you an idea about phase diagram fundamentals. Here again, what we see is that we have distributed the temperature pressure area into different regimes having different phases existing. And we have boundaries along which phases coexist. Right? With this back background, let us understand what is microstructure. This gives you a brief understanding about phase diagram. Now let's see microstructure. Microstructure is one of the most important things that you need to understand while understanding metallurgy and material science. Microstructure is basically, as the name suggests, micro, that is small structure. It is the structure as observed under a microscope. What is the importance of a microstructure? Microstructure, by studying it, we can predict what is the property of the material at hand. The property is influenced drastically by the nature of the microstructure that exists. Okay? Now, what are the different uh, components of a microstructure? When you see, let's say, a steel sample under a microscope, you will be able to see the phases, different phases present. You will be able to identify what is the green size of the different phases present. You will be also able to observe what are the proportion of the different phases present. How much is each phase present? Okay? And how are they distributed? How are the different phases distributed? What is the shape of the different phases? Is it needle-like? Is it uh, equiaxed, it is, is it elongated? Everything together, all these uh, properties, all these observations together lends to the ultimate property that the material will have. Okay? But what are the things that decides these parameters? What is it that decides what will be the phases present? The grain size? How much amount of different phase will be present? That is kind of dictated by uh, several things. One is what are the alloying elements present? Like if you have a steel, whether there is chromium present or not, whether there is boron present or not, what are the alloying elements present? That will affect the diff arrangement of the phases and the phases. What is the concentration of the alloys that you add? Are you adding 2% chromium? Are you adding 10% chromium to it? That will affect the microstructure. And last but not the least, and one of the most important thing is the heat treatment schedule that you are undergoing. You take a steel, you take it to 800 degrees Celsius, and you cool it rapidly to in ice cold water. Alternatively, you take a steel, you heat it to 800 degrees Celsius, and you let it furnace cool, that is it cools very very slowly. These two are two completely different kind of heat treatment uh, schedules, right? And this difference in heat treatment schedule will lead to completely different microstructure, thereby completely different properties. So the take home here is that microstructure dictates property and the microstructure itself is dictated by several factors including the alloying element, their concentration and the heat treatment schedule that you follow among which the heat treatment schedule is uh, one of the most important because you are able to form the heat treatment schedule as per your requirement. You cannot change the alloying elements as per your requirement always. Okay. Now these are two examples I have put up just to show you how microstructures look, how are different microstructures look, does different microstructures look. This is copper. 
to give you an idea this is 50 micron this is about the thickness of a hair single hair so this is quite a magnified view this is copper single phase you can see these are different grains this is one grain of copper this is a different grain of copper right so what we see is that not all grains are equally sized some are quite small grains some are relatively large grains but the average size will tend to be close by the median size will not vary a lot from the smallest or the largest okay and these things how they are what are the uh, what is the average median size how are the grains arranged this will affect the property this is another example of microstructure in which you have two phases present you can see a dark phase and you can see a light phase so this was single phase this is a two phase microstructure two phases need not exist only like this two phases can also exist like this in which some of them are one phase and some of them are different phase like this may be one phase this may be other phase and intermixed together here they are basically la in a lamellar shape when we'll study further we'll see that this kind of structure is known as lamellar structure obviously and this is obtained by eutectoid transformation tectoid transformation we'll see this in details in later lectures so just to give you a brief glimpse about what we studied today we began by the basic definitions component system solubility limit phase and uh, different kind of phases that can exist we saw the phase diagram for iron uh, rather water and we understood how to read a phase diagram for he from here and what are the details that we can extract from a phase diagram then we saw what is a microstructure we saw the details that can be understood from a microstructure what is the relevance of microstructure and with this uh, couple of figures of different microstructure i will conclude today's lecture next lecture we will take the study further from here Till then, have a great day. Goodbye.